OK, so good morning once again. Welcome, all of you, to uh, week three of our class. And welcome to all the e-learning students who have been interacting over the portal uh, and uh, keeping uh, in touch with the class. Uh, I'm really encouraged to see how some of you are really engaging uh, with the course and uh, you know, make it, bringing up questions. I really appreciate and bring more of it. And I encourage uh, even the students here online to you know, be active on the stream so that you know, if you have questions, you could also bring it up uh, later through the week on onto your classroom stream, and uh, we could either have a discussion or um, you know have a have a open conversation here itself. So I'm encouraging that you'll um, continue being involved. So uh, yeah, welcome once again. Let's just start with a word of prayer, and uh, we'll move right into the lesson. Uh, can I ask one of you all to please pray? Somebody uh, on the call, please. Yeah, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this beautiful day and for the beautiful class we are about to have. God, we just give everything else into your hands. Be with us and guide us throughout the session. Help us to have the good Wi-Fi connections. And every single thing that we learn today, Lord, help us to apply it in our lives so that we can be a blessing to others, so that we can help others when they fall. Because one, when one falls, the other picks up. That's what you have called us to do. Uh, Help us to open our mind and heart and listen to it. Help us to have the compassion that you had for the people uh, so that we can uh, shine your light to this world. Be with us and guide us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jafina. Thank you. OK, so um, as we move ahead into class, uh, um, any reflections about about what we learned last week, any thoughts, any questions. Uh, just We'll just probably take maybe two minutes to address that, and uh, we'll get started. So any questions, any thoughts, any uh, revelations, um, anything? Uh, I just want to say I'm, I'm really being blessed through the classes. I'm, I'm learning a lot. Uh, and uh, I, I should really say, uh, being a 19-year-old girl, this helps me a lot to work with myself also. Like, uh, it helps me a lot to understand even myself, like, what is my emotions? Uh, because I mm -hmm. think uh, uh, as we are being Christians, you know, I mean, when I was back in my hometown, these emotions are actually neglected. They're like, have faith, <laughs> be healed. Uh, but there is mm -hmm. no importance for the emotions and feelings that we have. Uh, but mm -hmm. uh, through this course, I'm learning that, you know, we can bring our emotions to God. And yeah. So I just want to say I'm really blessed too. And it really helps me to analyze myself a lot, like what state mm -hmm. I'm in, <laughs> what are the things that mm -hmm. I should work on so that I can be a better person uh, serving the Lord. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jafina. That's uh, encouraging. That's so encouraging. Thank you. Yes, Divya. Thank you, ma'am. Are you able to hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. My question is regarding um, uh, like when we say that uh, man uh, is an image bearer and uh, as we oh, were talking about the attributes of significance and security, self-worth, all this, uh, when I was going through that again, I, I felt I had a question regarding, so if it is uh, like that, is no, whether God also, you know, has these attributes, like if we are image bearers, so it means like, God also uh, would be having these attributes. Am I understanding it right? Um, hmm. Yeah. So, so these these attributes are given to man as his created uh, to given to us as his created beings, right? God is uh, uh, is all existent. He is he is the source of all of these attributes. He is all of that. He is love. He is purpose. He is security. Um, that's the characteristic of God. 
right? And that's what he's given us as his created beings. So uh, as God being the source of all this, it is there in him, all of these attributes that are given to man or man uh, uh, attributes that we had before the fall and the needs that we re need right now because of the fall, it's something that is already present. It's always been there. There's never, it, it, it wasn't a beginning or an end in God. It is who he is. He is love. He is purpose. He is security. So that's something that he gave us as well. So it was, it is always and was and will ever be uh, something that, that God is love, security and purpose. Sure, sure. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so uh, yeah. is it right to say that uh, God created man uh, with these, uh, you know, some with these attributes that only God can fill? Yes. And that's exactly why we see that. Uh, um, so, so if you remember, we said prior to the fall, this was something man inherently had because sin didn't separate man from God. Uh, man was in complete um, uh, fellowship with God, in one fellowship with God. But the minute that man began to look at himself um, because of sin and saying, and, and you know, looking at his own um, means to figure out a need, that's when we moved away from that inherent uh, capacity and moved into a place. And that's where we became, it, it becomes a need. And so, man looks at everything around them to fulfill that need. So you're absolutely right. It is only in their one relationship with God that's, that this can again inherently be met. Okay. So, so the, uh, the process of counseling, as we looked last time, is to restore man back into God's image, where uh, through the relation, although there is depravity that is there, it is to restore them back into the image <clears throat> by building back a relationship with God, right? So yes, you're right. It is found only in God, and that's the aim of counseling, to restore man into the image of God where they inherently sense those attributes with God. But being in, in the world that we are in, we are still bound by sin, and that's why our relationship with Jesus really matters, because our inheritance comes from knowing that he's the one who died for us. That because of our faith in him, we have all of these attributes uh, that we live by. But it is a walk of faith. We have to live by faith. We have to believe that all that he's given us is ours. Sure. Does thank you. Yeah? OK. Yes. Right. OK. Yes, thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you for those questions. Lovely. All right, so um, we'll move into our, uh, our lesson, our next uh, lesson. And um, if you'd like to follow through in the book, uh, I'm on page 15. And um, I'd like to do two chapters today, maybe the first hour, uh, this one, and the second hour, the, the second chapter. We, we may be going a little bit faster because uh, you know, we've missed a couple of classes because of the holidays and, and things like that. So, so we're going to uh, ensure that we move faster. However, this is this is pretty simple. It is um, uh, a simple chapter, and uh, um, this uh, what we're looking at is something that we call as a counseling relationship, or in other words, the word meaning therapeutic relationship. So, if you look at the word therapeutic, what does it mean? It means uh, a relationship between a counselor and counselee. So, uh, so you, this word comes from uh, therapeutic comes from the word therapy, where the relationship is um, uh, is is one professional. Okay, it is characterized by certain attributes. It's characterized by certain attitudes that is important in the presence uh, in the in the life of a counselor. So when you look at therapeutic, it actually means a relationship that that enables the other person to build their own skills or to build their own uh, uh, to have to have them develop and grow. And it is also a helping relationship. So the, a therapeutic relationship comes from these, these specific terms of, of enabling 
and terms of helping. So this, the relationship, uh, a therapeutic relationship, when you look at it, it is the interaction between a counselor as well as a counselee. Okay, so it's an interaction between the counselor and the counselee in which uh, it is characterized by specific attributes. And those are the three main attributes that we are going to be looking at today and, and highly important for uh, a counselor, whether we are Christian counselors or whether we are pastoral counselors, whether we are secular counselors, extremely important to have. Okay, so the importance of this um, uh, as you would see uh, on this slide, it is it, it uh, the, the therapeutic relationship or the relationship between the counselor and the counsel counselee is characterized by a couple of things. One is by trust and the second is by openness. OK, where over here, the counselee needs to be in a place where they feel the the um, the space and the security to open up as well as to be able to trust that the individual that they're talking to or the counselor that they're talking to has the best interests and sees them for who they are, okay? So whether it be a one-on-one -on -one, uh, counseling or whether you're doing it as a group, the, the characteristics of trust and openness is highly um, uh, valid here in this relationship, okay? And what happens when there is trust and openness, the, the person who's coming in for help is open enough to, to deal or to work through whatever problems they have come with or whatever issues or events that they have come with so that they have someone to uh, deliberate and talk with so that they are able to find new strategies or new ways of thinking, of behaving, of um, uh, feeling uh, or of working towards their issues and thereby finding what is uh, their God-given purpose, okay? So this is extremely important. Now in counseling, remember, and uh, and I'll, I'll bring, I highlight some of the um, things why a therapeutic relationship is so important that, um, a, a lot of times, what is the counselor doing over there? The counselor is encouraging or is building or enabling or helping the counselee to build themselves up, okay, uh, in, in the goals that they would come for. So let's say a, a counselee comes to you and says, I would like to be a better employee at work or I would like to be a better husband, I would like to be a better child, I would like to have a better relationship with God. So they come in order to find something and the counselor enables and helps them to come to that point of a goal that they would want. And how does that happen? So there are specific uh, ways that happens. Remember that your techniques or your approaches in counseling is not the only thing that helps a person. It is your own personal qualities that really um, uh, help the person to bring about change. Okay. So to give you an example, uh, so one of the things, um, so earlier in, uh, you know, and, and I'm going to bring in examples because I've been in this field so for so long and, you know, I, I just go back and whenever I read um, a certain uh, principles like this, I go back and think of how how true some of this is. So a lot of times, you know, when, when people have come, uh, some of them may have come with uh, extreme issues where there aren't easy answers to their problems, right? But for the very fact that they have a person who's sitting with them, listening to them, helping them just emote, just being able to maybe they just cry through one whole session. They are just able to express whatever they're feeling. And here there's a counselor who is sitting alongside them being without really judging, without really questioning these emotions, without really telling them to grow up and develop into a more stronger person. That in itself can be extremely therapeutic. So what I'm trying to say is it's just not the approach you use or the counsel that you give, but even your personal qualities that can really encourage growth in the person, in the, in the counseling. So that's why the relationship is extremely crucial in, in counseling. 
So what is the goal of, the, of a counselor is one, to provide that relationship, to bring about, uh, uh, to create a relationship that allows the counselee to be safe enough to evaluate, to discover what's happening within them, and to seek after certain goals that will help them in a, in a better way, to help them maybe to, to come up to a better level of thinking. Maybe it is a better way of dealing with, uh, with other people, or maybe it's a better way of, of having a better thought process. So never undermine the relationship uh, in this process, or it's called the counseling relationship, OK? Never, never undermine, because that is important for the counselor to create. You, the counselee is not the one who uh, who needs to really create that space because they've come in uh, with, with a need. So it's the counselor that actually needs to create that space. So what are some of the functions of that relationship? It's one, it needs to create a trustful, a trusting atmosphere where they where a counselee knows that they have a place where they can absolutely bring about and discuss anything, all right? And this may come in time. So um, don't feel perturbed if a person doesn't share or open up everything on the first time. It's perfectly OK. Even now, even after these years of experience, I've had people come to me after the second or the third session and say, this is something I, I was waiting to see how, when I'd be comfortable to share. And so sometimes information or their life story gets unpacked, you know, maybe in subsequent sessions. Why? Because people are coming first and foremost to really judge to see is this place safe for me? Is this place an atmosphere of safety and security for me? So you have, remember, you have different kinds of people who come to you. And uh, when they come, the goal that you have is to create that atmosphere of trust where they begin to trust you as a person so that they are in a place of being able to share and deliberate as much as possible. So one, it should create an atmosphere of trust. Second, it provides a medium of effect. Now, what does the word effect mean? The word effect means to emote, OK? Uh, when you're creating a relationship that is close, you, you would probably understand this, you know, think of a friend or think of someone you know that you can absolutely talk about without having to gauge or minimize uh, your emotions. OK, maybe when you uh, so, so think of that one person, if you have somebody like that, no matter what you say, they are there with you to hear you out and to encourage you to listen to you and not to put down your emotions or say, you know, that's not the way that it's feeling or it's silly to feel like that or, you know, you're becoming a baby. None of that. So it provides a medium of effect, which means a place where the counselee can really share and discuss and talk about what's what's affecting them. What's the next function? It models a healthy interpersonal relationship. Now, you know, what you are doing in a therapeutic or in a counseling relationship is you are modeling to your counselee or you are demonstrating to your counselee that a relationship can be healthy. All right. And that and, and who demonstrates that you as a counselor is demonstrating that. Right. Uh, demonstrating that through your empathy, demonstrating that through your uh, non-judgmental attitude. You demonstrate that through your acceptance of their emotions, acceptance of them as a people, of their confidentiality. So that's what you are demonstrating. And you're actually showing them, oh, there is a way that you can actually have a good interpersonal relationship. So that's what models it there. Okay, and and of course the most important one it motivates them to change. It motivates when when there is a relationship that is that is uh, one neutral, uh, that is respectful, uh, and you know when your counselee knows that the person who I'm talking to doesn't have any hidden agenda, 
it is not that my counselor has a hidden agenda that if I do such and such thing, it is going to benefit them. They know that there isn't a hidden ag agenda, right? So that in itself, when, when you are quest bringing up healthy questions to them, it makes them think and motivates them to change the, that perspective because they know that it is a safe relationship. It is a place in which where they can explore and they can um, make mistakes, they can, they can develop. Okay, so these are specific functions of it. So in a counseling relationship, what is important? The, the attitudes of the counselor is more important than the approach. And that's what I mentioned earlier, right? The attitude. So the way I, um, I approach my, my, the person who's sitting in front of me, not the problem. Remember, there are two different things, right? There's a person here and there is a problem. So the way that I approach the person is far more greater than the way uh, I, I approach the problem. All right, because if I have built uh, a positive uh, feeling or an attitude towards my counselee, the approach will be much, much faster. They will probably be in a in a much better place to accept uh, the questions or accept the the insights that you are giving them if your attitude towards them is is strong, is is one of care, and it is one of uh, specifically three attitudes which we are going to go in. So that, that's what we say. That's the bedrock of that relationship, okay? It also matters the way the attitudes are perceived in the um, counseling, all right? Now, what does this mean? Now, sometimes, um, especially, you know, in different cultures, uh, especially, in our, you know, in our Indian culture, we are very, um, uh, we are quite open to, to maybe, uh, um, uh, you know, touches, like, for example, if someone is upset, you could probably, you know, you could think of, you know, when someone's upset, maybe you give them a pat on their shoulder, or you hold their hand, uh, or things like that, right? You're expressing your uh, oneness with them. But maybe in a different culture, that is not something that is, uh, may not be acceptable, you know, the people are very wary about how much they approach or physically. So, it, it really matters how what you are doing as a counselor and what, what is perceived by them, by the counselee, right? And that's what makes a difference to the client. And sometimes it, you can gauge that by your open communication with them, okay? So uh, the basis of this entire lesson is one, that attitudes and the feelings of the counselee is far more important than approaches and the way that they perceive these um, attitudes are also important. Now, something that a research has discovered is that the best predictor of success in counseling is the quality of the relationship. Now, that's that's that was an amazing study, right? That uh, uh, um, counselors who have a good relationship with their counselee, an open good relationship with their counselee is a better um, uh, it, it, it's a better predictor of a success of a, of a counseling relationship than the kind of therapy you use or the kind of counsel you give. So it is within that relationship that you see that uh, uh, counseling actually is really helpful and, and it's something that really uh, works for the counseling. Okay. Now, in order to, for us to understand this, there are the, the, there is this person by name Carl Rogers, and uh, he was he was a, a behavioral scientist who speaks about these three main attitudes that a counselor needs to have. Okay, and these are these three attitudes, and this is what we'll go through one by one. The first one is empathy. The second is uh, congruence. And the third is what we call as unconditional positive regard. So empathy, congruence, and uh, uh, unconditional positive regard. So let's just look at each of them and uh, uh, you know just unpack that. And, and you will begin to see a lot more of how you can bring some of this into practice. So what is empathy? Empathy is, um, OK, uh, maybe let me ask you, uh, what, how different is empathy from sympathy? just so that I have you all involved as well. So how different do you think empathy is from sympathy? Any any thoughts? 
Okay, there's no right or wrong answers. Okay, this is you. You all can you all can share. Uh, I'll just try in just an attempt. Sure, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, sympathy is just uh, uh, you know uh, maybe comforting them, consoling them, uh, just uh, aligning with their feelings. But empathizing, I believe, is more more uh, more of uh, like stepping into their shoes, like kind of really trying to understand what they are going through, like trying to suppose I'm talking to a child, getting into their level and trying to understand mm -hmm. what is their situation, what are they facing, mm -hmm. so just coming to their level. That's what okay. I think. OK, yeah. thank you. Thanks, Devia. That's good. Anyone else? Anybody else has a thought? What? How is empathy different from sympathy? Well, uh, ma'am, uh, good morning. Uh, I, I think it's pretty similar to what uh, Vivia said. But, uh, again, sympathy is like you, you, you feel for the other person, whereas empathy is you assume what the other person goes through is uh, something. Uh, if, if you, you can relate with what the other person is saying and assuming that you know, if, if you are in that position, how you would feel, how, how you would handle the situation. OK. Thank you. Thank you, Lyndon. Wonderful. OK, so that's that's good. Right. Uh, I think you'll, you'll kind of have the essence about what empathy and sympathy is. So sympathy um, is, yes, you do feel for what is going on, but there is a sense of detachment from actually getting or being or um, being in the place of the person. So sympathy is you look at it from a very distance. You look at it from a distance. It is more a detached view about what, what happens, right? So, it, and, and it also um, uh, plays on how you involve yourself in, the, in helping the person. So you may involve, but it is more out of sympathy now, uh, more out of a sense of detachment rather than a sense of care. Now, empathy, I think, like what both of you said, is uh, some of those key words. I think you'll you'll put very well is putting yourself in the shoes of someone else. We're going to be looking at a little bit in the next chapter also, where you place yourself in the uh, in the position of your counselee, or you're wearing their shoes, or you are um, you are taking on their skin. Right, so which means it's almost as if you are going through the very same issue that they are. So it is the way of being with your counselee or with your with, with the with the person who you're talking to, and by doing so, you're also. So what what does empathy mean? It doesn't mean that you know you're so involved that you work on their behalf. That's not what empathy means, right? That that would be a lot more into what is happening in sympathy. That you're working on somebody's behalf because you feel you know you need to change. You are the one who needs to take action to change. But empathy is just in a place of. Uh, being in a different framework, you've moved yourself out from your framework and taken yourself into the framework of the other. So that's what it says, understanding within the framework of the other person's world. So you're almost taking off your shoes and your skin and getting up and going there to begin to see the world from the way that they see it. Okay. Um, and so how does this happen? This happens through listening, through acting listening, which means you are in a place of not just listening, but in a place of understanding. That is, you've heard something and you're making a certain deduction of that, what you have heard, which is an understanding. And you communicate that understanding back and you say, Oh, is it? Is this like this for you? So, for example, someone is talking. Uh, a person is talking about the way that they have, um, uh, let's say, uh, the way that they have a rebellious child. Okay, and they're talking about uh, how um, how the child has been has been giving them a hard time. So that is first listening. You're listening. Your understanding is you've kind of probably formulated and and when you communicate that understanding, you say something like. You seem to have come to the end of your rope. You seem to be quite frustrated. You seem to be 
hopeless in dealing with the issue, right? So what am I doing? I'm communicating, hey, I, I have understood what you're saying, and I'm reflecting this back to you to really see that whether I have understood and I've, I've been in your world for the last five minutes, OK? When is it that we are not empathetic is when we are listening and say, OK, uh, so uh, what are some of the things that you can do to change the situation for your son? Or you say, you know, why is your son so obstinate? So what have you done? You haven't communicated any form of an understanding. You've moved into the next step of trying to resolve the problem. But when you're being empathetic, you are spending time enough to live in that uh, hopelessness that the person is there so that that uh, you are able to ex um, demonstrate to your counselee that you have understood where they are at. OK, so what is the importance of this empathetic understanding is what are you doing? Uh, you are helping them see uh, that they are understandable, that whatever I'm going through, my counselor is able to see or counselor is able to um, understand or assume. They are able to internalize what I am going through. And what happens when someone feels understood, it increases their sense of esteem. It, incre it increases their sense of being able to be intelligible or, or workable with someone, OK? So the importance of empathy is you are you are helping the counselee see that they are understandable, and you're also helping the counselee see that, listen, you are important, and whatever you are going through is important for me. OK, so and when you are trying to do that, you are demonstrating that you are taking every effort and willingness to understand them. So that's what uh, that's that's the importance of empathic uh, understanding. Now, what are the functions of it? Okay, I'm just going to quickly go through it. It builds a relationship. It builds a relationship with the two, with the counselor and the counselee. When you are in a place of empathy, it stimulates your counselee to actually explore more about their problem. Right? You're just not dealing with it on the surface level you're breaking things like up like an onion remember we spoke about that you know to getting into the core you are breaking things up when you are in a place of empathy they are in a better place of self exploration they have they're exploring more about where they are at what is going wrong what is the need that i have you're actually working through that it checks understanding that's extremely good in empathy is because you are on track on the same track you're running parallelly you're not running in opposite directions with your counseling and of course it provides support it helps in better communication it also helps in focusing your attention on the person and the problem it also, empathy helps you restrain yourself as a counselor, not to give quick answers, not to give quick solutions, but to stay in in the pace of of the uh, of the counsel counseling. Okay, and it paves the way. Paves the way for what? For greater exploration. Okay, so these are some of the uh, importance that you would see in empathy. The point of you know, in counseling, you don't sympathize. Sympathize, like I said, is you are standing distantly and you are not expressing that you are with them. And some of the ways of doing that is, oh, okay, uh, you know, that's that's really sad. So, uh, you know, you do not spend enough time feeling what they are feeling. And you, when you sympathize, you're quickly getting into a place of solutions and say, OK, let's figure out how to work through this. But that's what we call is grounding. It's needed for a counselee to be grounded in, in the space of knowing that my emotions are being understood. Remember, the problem is there like a cloud. But below that, there are extreme emotions that need to be uh, really worked on to be processed and in sympathy you're moving away from the place of emotional uh, togetherness and moving away and looking at solutions okay so be careful not to sympathize okay i am going to move into the next one okay so um in empathy you generally use a statement like this okay you feel dash because dash so if you remember our susan's example Remember, uh, we will go back to it in the next hour. But it's it's about your feeling. So whenever they're saying something to you, 
you're saying, hey, Susan, you feel confused because of all the events that's been happening at your home. Or you feel nervous because of the exam that you are going to face today. Uh, you feel lost because, um, uh, because whatever, right? So the empathic understanding has a formula. And, and this is a good formula to use because the minute that you do this, you say this, you will begin to see someone opening up. Now, I have I have a um, maybe like a homework for you all to do, okay? And, and test this out. If you all have children at home, and let's say your child comes crying to you, okay? Uh, let's say he, ha he or she had a fall and they come crying to you. What do we often say? Why didn't you be more careful? You know, I told you not to go over there. I told you, right? This is, this is, so what is this? This is not empathy, all right? You may be feeling bad, but you're not empathizing. But rather, use this. You know, your child comes running and says, oh my, this must be so painful. I know this is hurting, isn't it? So what are you doing? You're actually gone back to your two-year-old or five-year-old shoes and saying, OK, you know, my daddy and my mommy understands that I'm feeling like this. And within minutes, you will find that they will be happy. They will run away and go. Because why? They have been understood. They have been, ex they, their feelings have been accepted. OK, so try this at home, whether it's with your spouse or with a friend or with your child, try this at home. And instead of, instead of rebutting or giving them a solution, get into the place of saying, oh, you feel upset because uh, you feel angry because the maid didn't come today, or you feel upset with me because I ignored you. You get into a place of empathic understanding, you will find that that conversation goes extremely well. OK, so is that a deal? Will you all try that? Thumbs up. Yes, OK, great. OK. OK, good. All right. So let, let's we, we'll move on. The uh, the second one that we're looking at is the first we said is empathy. The second is what we call as unconditional positive regard. OK, uh, now I'd like you to uh, pay attention to the words that I use here. It's it says it's not conditional positive regard, but it is unconditional positive regard. So what is what does this mean? So let I mean, let, let's unpack this. OK. Uh, this is something that's extremely vital for us in our relationship with others. And uh, uh, you know, we, we see scripture on this too, where it says, love one another as I have loved you. Okay. So if you if we were to unpack these these terms, um, uh, one, unconditional, what does it mean? It it is something that there is absolutely no conditions held to that, in the sense of. I accept you no matter what you have done. OK, there aren't any conditions of acceptance. It is the opposite of an evaluating attitude. It is an opposite of saying, OK, uh, this is what you've done. So, you know, I, I, I don't think I can accept what what you what you what you're doing. So this is it's a central uh, concept in in uh, um, counseling in order to build a good interpersonal relationship, OK? And you see that it is a need. It is a universal need for people to feel accepted, um, not based on certain conditions, OK? So unconditional meaning, there's no condition at all. There is just absolute acceptance. Positive means a warm acceptance of the person or a prizing. What is it saying? A sense of value that you are placing to the person. OK, and it isn't based on their color or their creed or their uh, uh, the crisis that they've been or their behavior or the kind of person they are. Nothing. It's just a warm acceptance of the person. And regard is caring. You are respecting them as someone who's absolutely unique and absolutely um, uh, precious. OK. Now, this unconditional positive regard, it is an attitude. It is something that is there within. Unless it's there within, it cannot be, it's not an action that you can do to someone else. So think of someone who you who you judge, all right? And you you pay a little bit of attention to what you feel about them. And then you will know that the issue is in your mindset. The issue is in the way that you have seen them as a person. Maybe they've done something to you. And it is out of that that you 
that you uh, regard them, right? And maybe you don't talk to them. Why? Because in your mind, okay, they're not trustworthy. Or in your mind, you know, I can't talk to them because this is what they have done. So remember, unconditional positive regard, it is an attitude. It is a feeling. It is a mindset. And it is generally not an action towards others, okay? It also shows support and acceptance of a person, no matter what the person says or does. You are, no matter where they are at, you are continuing to accept them. Now, this, I know, you know, as a lifestyle, it's far easier to do it, I believe, as a counselor than as a person with with members of your own family or friends, right? Because there is so much of an emo emotional attachment. But that's what we are called to do. That's what Jesus called us to do, to unconditionally love and accept others. And that's so much more in counseling, where you are going to be meeting with people who have very different backgrounds, who come with different stories, quite unacceptable from your own values and thoughts, but showing them the acceptance of who they are as a person. So remember, whenever you see people, separate the person from the problem. OK, the person is different. The problem is different. Just like how, you know, in parenting seminars, you would say separate the child from their behavior. Right. You don't say you're a good you're a, you're a bad boy, but you would say, you know, your behavior is something that needs to change. So remember, always separate the person from the problem. OK, so what does unconditional positive regard do? It shows an attitude of respect that you respect the individual no matter what they have been in. There is a sense of acceptance. There is a sense of warmth. You prize them and you give them a sense of value. You're affirming that they are valuable. And what are you doing here? You are demonstrating the same value that Christ showed towards you. You are doing it in turn to someone who comes to you for help. Okay. Now, unconditional positive regard is showing shows that show, shows a non-possessive care. What does that mean? That, for example, let's say your counselee says, you know, they want to make a choice that is totally outside of what you all have been discussing. Okay. Like, I'll give you, you know, one of these extreme examples of they, they made a choice that, uh, you know, they want to continue a certain affair, a, a, a marriage affair, right? And you have spent many hours uh, working with them where, you know, you've kind of figured out the pros and the cons. And finally, they say, yes, you know, I should go into this. And they do that. And finally, they go and do something else. What does unconditional positive regard mean? That you will continue to accept and engage and to regard them no matter whatever the decisions they make. So you have your feelings are not with any kind of a reservation or with evaluation. OK, this is what he did. So now, you know, he's a gone case and I just have to let him be or, um, you know, go, when he comes back next ask, next, ask him, why didn't you do what I said? And, you know, how is this going to help? And, you know, expressing your irritation and your anger. Now, that's something that we need to work on, that no matter what the person comes back with, we actually show that sense of unconditional positive regard. OK, so something that Carl Rogers said is that, you know, every person is like a sunset, that every time someone comes to you, uh, if you look at a sunset every morning, I'm sorry, every every evening, every dawn, uh, it never replicates another. It's always different. And this is the way that he's put it. You know, every person is like a sunset. And, and the way that you deal with people are very different. So it's important that we don't put people into boxes and thereby you know, create, uh, uh, create cookie cutters of them and say, OK, this is the way that you need to react, or this is the way that you need to be. You are with them unconditionally through that. OK? Uh, we'll go into the next one. Okay, the next one is genuineness and uh, congruence. Okay, what is genuineness? Genuineness is a place or a state where you are um, uh, in in your relationship with them. What your responses are, your outward responses are matches with what you feel about the person. All right, so. Um, and, and remember that that's, that's extremely important in counseling. So if, if you're sensing something, um, let's say, negative about your counselee, but you're attempting outwardly to be, to be positively regarding them, 
that can be easily found out okay it can it can be um it can reveal itself to your counselee. So genuineness is really working on what, on how you respond outwardly, and that matching with what is going on inside. Okay. Now this is is definitely something that uh, that is important for a counsel counselor to be able to evaluate and work on. So the the feelings that a counselor experiences within them. Uh, can come about and be communicated if we aren't careful. So, uh, you know, as the slide says, feelings that the counselor is experiencing is available to him, available to his awareness, and he's able to live these feelings, be them, and able to communicate them if appropriate. So that's so for you as a counselor to be very clear about where you are at when you are in the presence of a counsel counselee like for example there are times um that uh, you know as a counselor I, I personally there may have been certain settings or certain issues that i have felt extremely uncomfortable to deal with uh, you know whatever when whenever a counselor does come and if it, and the, and genuineness means to expressing to my counselee that this is probably where I'm at, and this is not something I can be of support to them. And as a result, I would be referring them to somebody else. Because if you're not in a place of genuinity, um, a counselee can quickly identify that and see the incongruence in the way that you are respond, responding, right? So it is an accurate matching of your experience your awareness and your communication is these three things your experience that means you may have experienced something uh, which is close to what your counsel is and how you are aware of that and what you communicate is a is an important thing so that's that's what really matters in genuineness because when you you're being congruent when you're being genuine that's when trust begins to build greater and what you're doing, what you are also attempting to do with your counselee is you are helping your counselee see that there could be certain weaknesses in you that uh, you're attempting to overcome, but you don't not want to use the, the therapeutic relationship or the counselling relationship to work on it. And it, it, it helps you as a counsellor to learn more about yourself and also open for change or open to to work on that that's what you're also expressing to your counselee and that's when they begin to build that confidence in you as a counselor so that's um and, and that's something that a counselor does like a model okay and why is that it is it's you know you've you've heard this adage do as i say and not as i do now that's something that we've got to be careful of because i may be saying something but i may be doing something else and that's not what i want to model to my counselee i want to model that whatever i am going through inside is what i would want to behave and what i would want to say so that's that's something that we we will need to ensure that we keep keep going okay so these three um constructs uh oh, sorry yeah so these yeah i'm just going to go back to show you that main slide yeah so these three uh constructs of empathy of congruence or genuineness okay and unconditional positive regard are highly essential in a relationship to be built now whether um definitely in a counseling relationship but then when you take these three principles these three attitudes into any relationship you will begin to see that trust that uh, uh that openness that sense of willingness to to open up definitely enhances that counseling session okay all right uh, any questions up here any questions and i have a question maybe you can answer in the next session sure. um, let's say for a person um as you mentioned in between like you know a person is sharing and uh, we suggest something and um so especially when it comes to addiction and uh, we uh, being a pastor we, we you know we tell them how do we overcome it through the word and stuff and uh, mm -hmm. after a few months you, uh, this person comes to us and saying you know the same happened again and 
so how do we um, uh, we know the principles are even the same how do we overcome from temptation is either same but how do we uh, communicate that without uh, you know judging uh, mm. maybe maybe, yes. maybe we can uh, discuss in the so okay sure yeah. sure we will we'll probably yeah. look at that in the next question okay next session yeah, okay you. it's uh, 10:53 on my clock we will come back at 11:3 for uh, our second day. okay thank you